Uh, okay, so um, Lisa, in her talk, uh, mentioned uh, the issues and problems with schools, and we have uh, along uh, Dr. Jenny Promos, who will give us an overview uh, or uh, about the support for children and young people with type 1 diabetes in Victorian schools, and the over overview of the work that the Department of Education and Training has been undertaking in relation to managing diabetes in schools. Jenny is the Principal Medical Advisor of the Department of Education and Training and she uh, also is a paediatrician. So, welcome Jenny. Good morning everybody. Thank you for coming out on this um, incredibly miserable morning, but isn't it lovely to see the winter come? Mm -hmm. um, it's an, I, always, I always wonder about the way the universe works. Um, we have been doing an enormous amount of work around diabetes and, I'm, and later in my talk I'm going to talk about a, a new body of work that we're about to undertake. And it always amazes me how this talk and this, uh, this forum can come along at exactly the same time as we're about to undertake you know, some new developments in, in, this, uh, in this field. So I do thank you for, uh, for coming along and, and listening to this. Um, let me start by a little, with a little bit of background first. So some of you may or may not be aware that in a school and in early childhood services, um, there's actually a, a policy and advisory guide. So there's a school policy and advisory guide, what we call SPAG, and in that there are over 50 health policies. And it's my role to make sure that they are up to date, that they are clinically um, evidence informed, and that they are able to be um, used in a school space in a way that, you know, that, that non-medical staff or non-health related staff can actually understand them and recognise the importance of them. Now with 50 of them, it's almost impossible to, to keep that schedule up when you've got a skeleton team, as we do. Um, nevertheless, what we've been trying to do over the past couple of years is to really work on, on the main prevalent con conditions. And so many of you will be aware that there is a, there is a ministerial order that mandates that schools are up to date in terms of training and um, support of young people with anaphylaxis in schools. And so that, that falls under our, you know, sort of my portfolio. But we've also been working very strongly looking at the other conditions of asthma, allergy, diabetes and epilepsy, because they, they seem to be the main conditions that are not necessarily common, but not uncommon. And most schools, you know, over their lifetime can certainly expect to have some, you know, some students with, with diabetes in them. Now, not all schools do. We estimate, it's, do you know how hard it is to get data? So one of the things that I've been trying to do in the department is to say, if you want to change something, measure it. How hard is it to get the number of young people that, in, that sit in the, in the school sort of um, environment with, di with type 1 diabetes? It's almost impossible to get a number. Um, so these are NDSS data. We know that there are approximately 2,500 students um, in Victoria that we estimate are in the school system. We think that there are, a, there are about, yeah, 2,500. We think that there are probably about five to 600 in the early childhood space. And the work that I do covers both early childhood and schools. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do in early childhood services as well. Um, what we're trying to do, and one of the things that I'm putting in place for the first time this year, hopefully, is rather than rely on the hospitals, rely on the NDSS, you know, to try and just get some, this is going to be rough, but to try and get some information from the schools themselves about whether they have students um, in them with diabetes. So every August, principals have to fill out what's called this, um, the supplementary census. And the supplementary census is a range of, it probably takes them one or two hours, you know, of, of, as, but also get, have, they have to get all this information and a whole range of different things that happen in a school and, um, ask, and answer this massive questionnaire that gives the department some information about what they do. Because of the ministerial order in anaphylaxis, we do ask them questions about anaphylaxis so that we get a sense of how many schools are actually um, enforcing the policy that we have around anaphylaxis and anaphylaxis management. And for the first time this year, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to ask some questions around diabetes. So that we're genuinely going to ask them, how many children in your school have a, a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes? Um, what you know, we're, we'll be able to get the name of the school that these you know, that students are attending. So when when this is only for government schools, I have to say, and we are going to look at whether and I'm going to use the word compliance here, Phil, as opposed to adherence. <coughs> how many schools are actually complying with our policy? Um, the reason I say that in terms of compliance is that over the past few years, we've actually done an enormous amount of work to really try and update our policy, um, and it was probably. 2014, I think we started, we had the Children's Hospital um, the Di Department of Diabetes and Endocrinology, the, Ch the Monash Children's uh, Diabetes and Endocrinology and Diabetes Victoria. We brought everybody together to say, okay, how can we do this better? And as a result of that, we've become, we've updated our policy and I'll go through some of the expectations that are in our policy. 
and we have sort of helped to try and develop a statewide sort of approach to the action plans and management plans for students with diabetes. So at least we, if we could be clear about what it is that our expectations are of schools, the hope is that the schools will actually implement that. Now the difficulty we have in Victoria is that there are three school sectors um, and the department has different levers of influence I guess over each of those three sectors and so yes we can you know we can ex reasonably <coughs> expect government schools need to actually follow our policies but we have less influence or less uh, you know we, we have less um, say over how the independent sector and all the and the Catholic education sector follow follow the policies nevertheless any work that I do in our department around health and, and health policy you know the expectation is always that it's available to those to those sectors as well and that we share that and we do as much communication with them as we can as well and keep them <coughs> when we're when we're um, doing consultations for example we always have them in the room as well and, and have them as part of the policy making process so they feel that they can own that policy as much as the government sector owns the policy I don't think I need to tell any of you what the impact of type 1 diabetes is on early childhood services and schools you know Lisa did that better than anybody can and and you know and as a, as a paediatrician who sits in the room and listens to some of the stories, I had spent last week in, an, in a two hour meeting where um, it, was, it was really very distressing sometimes as a paediatrician to listen to eight families tell me what the impact of you know, their children's diabetes was in terms of their experience at school and in, and in, early, and one, child, in one woman in kindergarten. Um, I get it. That's, and that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is how do you get the bureaucrats to understand that? And my job is really to take that clinical, that real life sort of experience and the evidence, you know, in terms of the research, and how do we take that very individual view and translate it back up to a much higher systems view that will work for every, you know, for every school. And that can be, you know, that can be really difficult. And sometimes you do have to um, compromise the way that, um, you know, every single minor detail. Nevertheless, with diabetes, I think I can be relatively clear in saying that, you know, we are very clear in our policy that diabetes is considered a disability under um, the, anti, you know, the Disability Discrimination Act. Um, schools have a legal obligation to make reasonable adjustments to ensure that that young person with type 1 diabetes is able to um, experience that school in the same way as the, rest of their pe as the rest of their peers in consultation with them and their families or their carers. Um, and the question then becomes, what are those reasonable adjustments, I guess? We expect schools to develop, you know, very clear health and management plans for students with diabetes, as, I, as um, you know, very clear around other conditions, as I said earlier. And we do expect school staff to have the relevant education and training that is required to support that student with type 1 diabetes. So if you actually look at our policy specifically, and the policy is available um, on the public website, www.education.vic.gov.au. If you just go to education.vic.gov.au and put in, in the search term diabetes, the diabetes policy will pop up. So all schools are required, um, this is part of the work that we did in 2014-15, all schools are required to have um, a diabetes action plan and management plan, and they're filled out by the, by the young person's um, medical treatment team usually, and they're expected to have a health support plan. Now, what I usually say is the action plan and the diabetes management plan are the what do I need to do to support this young person's diabetes. So that's all the clinical information that they need. The health support plan is the how do I support this young person. And they're things like, you know, I will meet with the parents every term and we will talk about what the issues are. You know, I will identify which teachers and which education staff in my school will be the ones that are the go-to for my son or my daughter to, to help support their diabetes. Um, I will work out, you know, how, you know, where this young person feels well supported to be able to, to do whatever it is. You know, to set out exactly the, you know, my kid can, you know, that in, during an exam, you know, there is an expectation that you will be able to measure your glucose and, and have food with you or water with you or whatever you need during exam conditions. You know, all those things. So it stipulates all the stuff around how the school will support that young person. Um, you know, for camps, we will have a camp plan and we will endeavour to get that at least a term before, or, you know, or, or whatever it is, so that there is an agreement and the parents have to sign off on that agreement, that health support plan, with the principal or the assistant principal or whoever they delegate for health and wellbeing. So some schools have health and wellbeing coordinators, some schools have the AP who does it, the assistant principal. So some of the some of the examples of the reasonable adjustments, you know, 
it's, I know it's easy to say that school should create a culture of inclusion and support um, for students with diabetes, but as Lisa said, there was a, you know, one of the families last week brought a principal of their primary school, you know, their children are now in secondary school, but a, you know, she has twins with diabetes. Um, the principal from their primary school came and he changed the entire roster of the, you know, the, the timing of periods so that that young person, you know, when they che check their glucose was on, on the, um, just at the beginning of, of recess and just at the beginning of brunch, the whole school's timetable was changed to support that young person with diabetes. Um, and you know, in conjunction with the school, um, with the school community, you know, that he, he was doing some extraordinary things. What's clear is that when there is a culture and a willingness to do it, schools can do it and do it well. We expect young people to be able. You know, the other <coughs> issue for me, I guess, that's become a real you know, problem practically, is yes, a lot of young people can self-manage diabetes, but what do we do with the young children who are now being put on pumps or who, who require insulin in administration during the, you know, early in the day, in kindergartens or in, in early, the early years of school, who really can't be expected to self-manage their diabetes? Who is going to be that in loco parentis, you know, sort of adult who is going to help support them? If that is the situation, we do expect schools to identify education staff who are able to do that, who will work with the family to get the training that they need. So one of the things that we have done, um, and perhaps to preface it by saying, when you work in an, a government department, you know, you can get advice from thousands of different places. And one of the issues is how do you get the advice that is sort of the best reflection of what the population of young, you know, sort of, a, a, I guess, consumers with type 1 diabetes are saying. And so we do tend to work with peak organisations. And, and we did, when we did updated the policy, initially work with Diabetes Victoria. Um, and I recognise that there are probably other peak organisations. It's one of the discussions we have been having with, um, you know, in that meeting last week, that we need to perhaps expand, the, you know, the, the range of um, consumer stakeholders and thinking about that, and we will going forward. Um, but one of the things that we did do with Diabetes Victoria was to say that, okay, they run a seminar, an education seminar. It's not about specifically training on an individual child's type 1 diabetes management, but we do expect staff to be sent to that education seminar that Diabetes Victoria run. And if there are problems with that, you know, Diabetes Victoria are fantastic at actually helping us get families in when it's full or get staff in when it's full. Or, you know, it's, there are times when we have paid for staff to travel, you know, long distances to get the, to go and do the education. And we're continuing to work with them to look and see whether we can develop an online sort of education module moving forward um, so that there's an expectation that all staff, you know, sort of do some education. But I, I'm very clear, that is education. That is actually not training. But we expect all, you know, all schools who have a child with type 1 diabetes to have staff educated in what is diabetes, what are the, impl you know, the impacts on schooling, what are the things that we need to do to support this young person. So, um, administering glucose, oh well, let me go, administering insulin. If a child does need an adult to help administer insulin, um, again, it, it, there's, this, this, there's this issue that, that we've come across around, you know, how much support can a school give? You know, is a school a quasi-health service? Do you need to have a medically trained person to be giving that insulin? Um, is having a medically trained education staff member enough? And the issue of school nursing comes up. You know, not all schools have school nurses. The, the departmentally employed school nursing staff, the primary school nurses in primary schools, have a very specific role around surveillance and monitoring. They don't have a clinical role. And the secondary school nursing program that is run by the department has a very strong health promotion role. So that they're not clinicians who are working in schools in a clinical capacity. They actually have a different role. Many schools have school employed nurses. They've identified an issue for a range of different issues and they actually choose to use their budget to employ a school nurse. And many of those school nurses, such as a school in Malvern, who does have, I think, five or six kids with type 1 diabetes, they have a school employed nurse. And she is the one who is responsible for overseeing the care of those students. So it does work for some schools. It doesn't work for all schools. Um, but we do expect that education staff members will be identified who can be taught to inject that young person, that child, um, and they're taught either by the parents, you know, it, it, again, and, it, and it's about having a relationship that is open and non-judgmental, as we've been talking about, with the family. They're either taught by the carers of that child or in the instance where it needs more sort of, you know, specialised or they're not confident, you know, we say to them, well, if you need to go into the hospital to see that child's treating team, you know, the parents will make an appointment for you. You know, you need to go into the hospital and be taught by that, you know, by that child's diabetes educator or, you know, the doctors or whoever, the nurses or whoever. With respect to glucagon, one of the pieces of advice we were given by Diabetes Victoria is that glucagon is not first-line treatment, which is why, it, why it's not actually on the action plan or management plan. I do recognise now that perhaps that, you know, that is not quite as black and white as it sounds. And certainly we are um, 
for camps, but for schools where they're quite remote or rural or where glucagon has been recommended as, as a method of treatment for, for a child and is part of their management plan, then the expectation is that they, those staff will be trained. And those staff will be tra trained by, those, by that child's medical treating team. So they have to go into the hospital to get that training. If I could just talk a little bit about um, early childhood services for a minute. This is where it does become actually quite complicated. So fortunately the numbers are quite small, obviously, but it sounds like they're growing. Um, young children do need additional support. Usually when they're very, very young in childcare, the families still tend to take responsibility for their children's diabetes. Um, and I think that's probably develop, you know, and, and developmentally appropriate. But also early childhood staff are a lot more, unlike schools, you know, it is a little, little less regimented. So they are actually able to be a, more involved in that child's care. Nevertheless, the issue becomes one of quotas and ratios for early childhood, because there's a national quality framework around the number of staff required for any number of children, one in 11. And so if you have one staff offline helping a child's diabetes, what happens to the rest of the staff? And so for children in kindergarten, they are eligible for a kindergarten inclusion support package, which the kindergarten applies for. And I have to approve every kindergarten inclusion support package for children with complex medical and mental health, with complex medical conditions. And, um, and diabetes is just one of the automatic approvals. So there's been a fair amount of um, angst over the past few years uh, at various times of, you know, my, my kindergarten won't get it and, and, you know, we've got to go and get the hospital to, to do a great big whiz-bang application. You know, if I see diagnosis type one diabetes for a kindergarten inclusion support, you know, for a KISS package, it will be approved, um, full stop. <laughs> because we recognise that that kindergarten needs to be able to hire an additional member of staff to be there to actually look after the, you know, the, all the other children for that child to have, you know, the identified staff member to be able to be supported, to, to support that child's diabetes. The issue around training and education is the same for early childhood services as well as schools. So Di DV run, Diabetes Victoria run um, early childhood service um, focused seminars as well as everyone's school focused seminars. And, and, the, and by and large my experience, my anecdotal experience, very anecdotal, is that the early childhood services are actually really good at, at, um, at doing that. Camps, excursions, special activities have become the bane of my existence. I am very clear, our policy is very clear that students are expected to be supported at camp and that schools need to make the appropriate um, time, you know, sort of forward, to think forward in enough of a way to be able to develop, a, you know, for that child's medical treating team to be able to develop a camp plan for that child. And if that means training people in glucagon, that's what it means. And if that means, um, getting up in the middle of the night to check, you know, sugars, that's what it means. If that means two staff have to get up in the middle of the night in terms of the, the Catholic Education Office, then that's what it means. You know, now again, you know, some parents want to go on camps, some parents don't want to go on camps. Parents have a right not to go on their child's school camp. Parents have a right to go on their child's school camp. And this is about, you know, schools have to be able to be a bit more flexible and not to actually... Um, <coughs> insist on one way or the other, but to actually listen to the families and come to a shared agreement that both are happy with. Um, and similarly for physical activity, you know, I, you know, I just get these horror stories every so often where a young person, you know, you're not allowed to eat your carb or you're not allowed to check your sugar before, you, you know, you're going to go off and do the cross country run or whatever it is. No, you know, it is very clear you have to make sure that you're thinking about what the impacts of that child's type 1 diabetes are on the physical activity that you're running, you know, program that you're running in your school. And similarly, in terms of the timing of the meals, they can't be delayed. Um, they need to be managed as outlined in the management plan. And exam support, you know, one of the examples that came up last week was, you know, a young person who was staring at the examiner and the examiner felt really uncomfortable. And the first question you, know, you ask when you know a child's got diabetes, well, are they low? Is their glucose low? Yep, it was, you know. They should be able to have, to be tested during, and they should be able to test themselves during an exam or have someone test them during an exam. And they should be able to have, you know, sort of, um, um, food there or carb there to, to eat at the time. And similar around staff continuity, staff change all the time. Um, they need to stop and, you know, and think about these things proactively rather than reactively and make sure that they have enough staff trained at any particular point in time so that there is continuity for that child's support. So that brings me to what we're about to undertake. Um, interestingly, about a month ago or six weeks ago, I had a meeting with the Department of Education, uh, well, with the Deputy Premier, who is the, Depart the uh, Minister for Education, and with Bronwyn Halfpenny MP, who is the, the Vic Victoria's <coughs> Ambassador, I guess, for diabetes. And um, she's quite interested in the issue of diabetes support in schools, and we met with um, 
Minister Molino, who was all actually really interested um, and recognised, and I think we all recognise that the policy itself, I think is pretty good. You know, I mean, I think we've done a pretty good job with this policy. We're continuing to update, we recognise that we need to update it with CGM coming on board, with more insulin pumps coming on board. We recognising that we recognise that we need to, up, you know, constantly iteratively update the policy as we do with all of our health policies, and we we will be going through that process. Um, um, well, it's already started actually the process to, to do that, and we'll do that in conjunction with the experts, with the two children's hospitals, as well as with uh, the peaks. But we also we recognise that we need better data, as I explained earlier. But what we've agreed with the minister is that we will develop much more practical guidelines. We recognise that what happens here is that the policy is one thing, but getting schools to actually own it, understand it and do it is another. And how do you hold schools to account to make sure that they do this? Um, government has different levers for holding schools to account and there's been a lot of advocacy around having a ministerial order for diabetes management as well as, you know, as we have with anaphylaxis. The reason we have a ministerial order for anaphylaxis is because that a child, um, it, it came out of the case at Scotch College where the child died of anaphylaxis, you know, the, the boy that was given um, peanuts on a, on a school camp. And so it was, a, it was a direct coroner's, it was an inquest sort of um, determinate recommendation in which the department, which the government agreed. I don't want to see a child die of diabetes um, in order to be able to get a ministerial order. And so from my perspective, what we're doing is putting together a series of options for the minister, one of which will include, these are the pros and cons of having a ministerial order. Um, now, one of the things I've also learnt as, a, as working in government for probably a little bit too long is that ministerial orders can mean one thing. It might mean that the humane, da humane date a particular series of actions, but actually getting schools to do it is, act is not as, it, it's, it just doesn't happen actually. And so we still, I still see quite a few um, um, adverse event alerts. So the hospital, the, the department has a, a series of adverse event sort of alerts that come directly to me. Uh, we get very few around diabetes and that's one of the issues actually. I, you know, if I could say, look at this, we have a diabetes, of, you know, sort of incident every couple of weeks. You know, it's, it kind of gives you more authority to be able to argue. We actually get relatively rare numbers. We get quite a few for anaphylaxis, you know, um, and we get lots for epilepsy. I would see at least one child having a seizure in a school a day. So, um, so I don't have that little lever to be able to argue for, but I, that's okay, we don't need that. What we do need to do though is we're going to develop practical guidelines. So we're going to really look at that issue of implementation. How do we take a policy that is relatively, you know, comprehensive, keep that updated, keep that, you know, sort of, you know, uh, as evidence informed and as best practice as we can. How do we look at implementation? How do we develop different levers, different incentives, different sticks and different carrots that we can use with the school sector to try and get principals to do this? And one of those would be a ministerial order. And we will put a series of, a, you know, sort of options to the minister and the minister's office. And, um, and I have no way of knowing what they're going to decide. But, you know, I can certainly strongly advocate one way or the other. Um, but in the meantime, what we will do is we'll develop some practical guidelines. So what we in the health system would call clinical guidelines, I guess we would call them practical or implementation guidelines for support of children with diabetes in early childhood services and schools. Um, and so what we're planning to do, uh, it's just starting, what we're planning to do is to develop um, an expert reference group. So that's really to update the policy and that will include getting back Monash Children's, Royal Children's, Diabetes Victoria, probably JDRF, probably use your Facebook group, Lisa, um, to look at the content of the policy and update that, and then get a, a broader schools reference group, get the regional staff involved, get the regional <coughs> health and education staff involved, get principals involved, get parents and consumers involved, to look at what can we put in place that will actually help you know, un get, help get principals to understand the gravity and the seriousness of what it means to have a child with type 1 diabetes in their school and the importance of what, of what it means to be a, an active partner in the support um, of the management of that child's diabetes. So that, is, that process is just starting. Um, we're hoping it will take the rest of this year. Um, I don't know how long it will take. We know that the clinical guidelines for anaphylaxis took 18 months. To, to complete. I'm hoping it won't take that long. Um, and so that hopefully we can start 2018 with you know, a big, broader group. But, what we're, but at the same time, we are still doing a lot of work to try and communicate with schools about the importance of this and the importance of them following this. So if any of you who work in the school sector or who have issues um, with an individual case, you can always contact the Regional Disability Coordinator in the Department of Education in your region. 
Um, they are the people who often deal with the individual issues. Um, you can always contact my office and we often will get Diabetes Victoria on the phone or on email saying, I've got an issue with another school, guys, can you fix this? Um, and we try and direct that to the, the appropriate um, team to be able to actually go into that school and work through those issues with that family and those, those, and those educators. So I'll leave it there. Thank you again for listening and I hope that I've given you some information about how the system works to support individuals, which is sometimes quite hard to think about that, you know, individuals all the way through to the population level. So thank you.